And now, to 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 end this uh, all these presentations, Professor Ron Mohan is going to talk about exercise, exercise, heat, hydration, and the brain. Thank you, Professor Mohan. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Lewis, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and talk about hydration because it's a subject I care about a great deal. I should begin with a disclosure of interest. I've worked with a number of food and beverage companies over many years in relation to the effects of hydration on performance. The background to this slide shows something which struck me many years ago when I was working with the British Olympic team preparing for the uh, games in Atlanta in 1996, and it shows a hot sun sucking the water out of a struggling British athlete. So we're familiar with the problems we experience when we exercise in the heat, and this is a situation in which hydration is crucially important. But it's an also an area in which there's a lot of misunderstanding and many gaps in our knowledge. I'll begin with a simple demonstration of the effects of exercising in the heat on performance. This shows a study we did some years ago. We had people pedal a bicycle at a constant power output on four separate occasions, once when the temperature was 4 degrees centigrade, once when it was 11 degrees centigrade, 21 degrees, and 31 degrees. And you can see that the time they could continue to exercise before becoming exhausted decreased markedly with higher temperatures. Even at 21 degrees, which most of us would consider a very pleasant environment in which to take some exercise, performance was significantly less than it was at 11 degrees. This is endurance exercise lasting about 90 minutes. In the context of a football game, this guy could last the full game and play a few minutes of extra time. Running at the same speed, doing the same amount of extra effort, he would be substituted just a few minutes into the second half. So this is a fairly dramatic effect on exercise performance. But that's relevant to the athlete. We also have to consider the implications for non-athletes taking exercise in a warm environment. And one of the key issues there is that, how, that the environmental temperature affects not only performance, it affects how we perceive that performance. And what this shows is the subjective ratings of effort, how hard the exercise feels, over the first 50 minutes of that exercise that I just showed you. And you can see the red when time was short. Clearly, from early on in the exercise, it feels much harder. So if we accept that physical activity is good for people, and I think most of us would accept that, if we are to encourage people to take exercise, we have to recognize that the uh, subjective sensation of effort is a major barrier to exercise. At the same work rate, which will produce the same physiological benefits, the exercise feels much harder in a warm environment than it does in a cool environment. So we have to take account of this information. We also have to take account of the, the reasons why this happens, and we need to understand why exercise is harder in the heat. And it's not the heat per se, it's the effect on body temperature. Now, we can change body temperature in various ways. In this particular study, they changed the temperature of their subjects before they did exercise by putting them in a bath of water. And they either went in cool water, in water at body temperature, or in warm water. When the subjects were immersed in cool water before doing an exercise test, they could keep going for 63 minutes. When they were immersed in water that didn't change body temperature, they could go for 46 minutes. When they were immersed in warm water to raise body temperature before exercise, they were exhausted after only 28 minutes. So when you see someone warming up before they do exercise in a hot gym, you have to question why they're warming up. It's not going to improve performance, it's going to impair performance. You're much better to cool down rather than warm up before you do exercise in the heat. And we know, too, it's not just performance. Again, it's subjective sensation of effort. In this study, you warm people up or you cool them down before they do exercise. And this is body temperature. You warm them up, cool them down, and then they exercise. Clearly, the body temperature much higher when they've been warmed up. And this is the subjective sensation of effort. The work rate is the same. The sensation of effort much greater when people have been warmed up 
rather than when they've been cooled down. So some clear implications if we're promoting exercise to improve health. We have to understand why some of those things are happening. And of course, the perception of effort, it may feel as if our muscles and our lungs and our heart is working hard, but ultimately it's something that happens in the brain. This is a study from my colleague Susan Sheriffs looking at some of the effects of mild dehydration on some aspects of uh, physiological function. She took a group of subjects, studied them twice, once when they were fluid restricted for a day and a half, and once when they drank normally. I'm sorry about the complex slides, but this shows body weight when they were fluid restricted for a day and a half, and body weight which was more or less maintained when they ate and drank normally. Not surprisingly, the subje subjective sensation of thirst on a 10 centimeter visual analog scale, much higher when they weren't drinking than when fluid was not restricted. And you can see here some evidence of a circadian rhythm because the measurements were made morning and evening. And this is the subjective sensation of mouth dryness. Hardly surprisingly, if you're restricting fluid, your mouth feels dry compared to when you're eating and drinking normally. What about some of the other responses from the subjects? This is a question that says, how alert do you feel just now? And you can see when drink, eating and drinking normally, the subjects maintain a fairly constant response. When they're fluid restricted, the alertness response, again with some circadian rhythm, decreases quite dramatically. This question asks, how tired do you feel just now? And just fluid restriction for 24 hours produces a dramatic difference in the subjective sensation of tiredness. This says how well able to concentrate do you feel just now? And there's a fairly dramatic reduction in the ability to concentrate. And this is a non-subjective headache type symptom. And again, fairly dramatically different. So I'd ask you if you're taking a taxi back to the airport today or tomorrow, you might wonder whether your taxi driver has been staying hydrated. Does he feel like this or does he feel like this? It may make a difference to his ability to get you to the airport in one piece. We know too that hydration affects performance but also affects the perception of effort in much the same way that heat does. These are studies from the US military. They've dehydrated individuals by something between 1% and 4% of their body mass do a standard exercise task, and ask the subject, how hard does the exercise feel? The same power output, but you can see with increasing dehydration, it goes on the scale from somewhat hard, which is fairly tolerable, not too bad, to very hard, which is a quite unpleasant sensation. So the same exercise not only feels harder in the heat, but it feels harder when we're dehydrated. So when we're thinking about hydration and exercise performance, we have to consider two issues. We may start exercise already dehydrated and somebody in an event which lasts only a few seconds, clearly there's no scope for becoming dehydrated during the event. But in a football game or a marathon race, if we don't drink, we'll become progressively dehydrated over time. Fortunately, a meta-analysis has recently been published looking at the effect of pre-exercise dehydration on performance. And what they showed, taking, I think, 28 different studies, if individuals begin exercise dehydrated, the mean power output, the work rate that can be achieved, reduced by about 3%. That's a big difference to an athlete. Significant reduction in exercise performance, but also a call for some more studies to look at the effect of modest dehydration because we don't have as much information as we should. Would anyone ever begin exercise already dehydrated? Well, these are some data where we've used urine osmolality as a marker of hydration status. Most people would agree that a urine osmolality of about 700 milliosmoles is the upper limit of euhydration. Above that, you're probably somewhat dehydrated. And at 900 milliosmoles, you're probably dehydrated by about 2% of your body mass. These are measurements made at four different times of the year across a football season in some of Europe's best football players. This is the team that won the Champions League in 2002, the season in which these measurements were made. These are measurements made on the players when they turn up for training. They're given no warning that a urine sample will be collected. The urine's collected as they arrive for training and we measure the osmolality. You'll see that most of the players are dehydrated to some extent 
when they arrive for training. We see similar findings when they arrive for match play. This is not a good um, situation in which to begin training or indeed to begin match play. So dehydration before exercise is probably relatively common. What about de dehydration during exercise? I thank uh, Dr. Eric Goulet for permission to quote from an unpublished study, which is currently submitted for publication. He showed that exercise-induced dehydration begins to impair exercise performance when you're dehydrated by more than about 1% of your body weight, and it's progressive. So there's a meaningful and substantial effect on performance when you're dehydrated by more than about 2% of your body weight. So the evidence seems fairly clear. Dehydration is not a good thing. But the question is why? And we have to understand why we feel more tired in the heat, why we feel more tired when we're dehydrated, and why performance is reduced. Bodil Nielsen, who's done much work in the area, said it's all down to body temperature. It's nothing to do with what's happening in the circulation and the muscles or anything else. It's something happening. But that doesn't tell us the mechanism. It's just a black box. Something is happening with body temperature, and we need to know what it is. One of the issues, of course, is typically when we've measured body temperature in the past in humans, and this is a measurement made at the end of a marathon race, this chap is measuring this chap's rectal temperature, we look at temperature in the rectum because it's convenient. But it's much easier to believe that the brain is important and the temperature of the brain is important rather than the temperature of the rectum. So maybe we've been looking in the wrong place. But it's hard to measure brain temperature. You can do it in the rat, and studies in the rat show that if we have animals living in a comfortable environment and we then get them to run in a warm environment, they can run for just about 30 minutes. If we make the environment hotter, 38 degrees rather than 33, exercise time comes down. If we pre-warm them, exercise time comes down fairly dramatically. But in all these situations, the brain temperature fatigue is fairly constant. So the evidence from the rat model suggests there's a constant brain temperature at which we become fatigued. Unfortunately, we don't at present have good measures of brain temperature in humans during exercise. In Copenhagen, where they can do some invasive studies, they've measured the temperature of the arterial blood going to the, the brain and the venous blood draining the vein by putting catheters in arteries and veins in the neck. They show that the brain indeed does get very hot during exercise, but it's difficult to quantify the absolute temperature. We're currently in discussion with some nuclear medicine experts. We believe it's possible to me measure brain temperature using magnet magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and we hope to have those measurements fairly soon. So we have to look at something else we can do in the brain. Now, the idea that the brain's important isn't a new one. This is a quote from a textbook from Francis Bainbridge, published in 1919, Bainbridge of the Cardiovascular Reflex, and he said, we've known for a long time that fatigue's all about things in the central nervous system. And he said rather perceptively, there appear to be two types of fatigue, one arising entirely within the central nervous system, the other in which fatigue of the muscles themselves is super added to that of the nervous system. And that's a very insightful observation. And I think it's still as valid today as it was 100 years ago. So what's the link between what's happening in the muscles and what's happening in the brain? Well, the link may be related to some of the central neurotransmitters, the messages that go between neurons in the brain. And there's a suggestion that serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine concentrations in the brain are increased after exercise. And we know that serotonin is important in mood, tiredness, lethargy, and a number of other symptoms. Eric Newsom and his colleagues picked up on this and showed that changes in circulating tryptophan and other metabolites could influence central serotonergic activity. So there's a link between the metabolic events in the muscle and what's happening in the brain. Perhaps a more direct way to investigate that is to use some pharmacological manipulation. And this is a study we did about 20 years ago. We gave some healthy volunteers paroxetine, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor used in the treatment of depression. We gave it to healthy volunteers who were not depressed, acutely before exercise, or we gave them a placebo. When they got paroxetine, 
the time was reduced from 116 minutes on the placebo to 94 minutes on peroxidine treatment. So the administration of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor reduced exercise performance without any obvious cardiovascular or metabolic effects. It's not just serotonin that may be important in fatigue. There are a number of other neurotransmitters, and there's been much interest recently in dopamine. To follow that, my colleague Phil Watson did a study in, in Belgium. He had subjects exercise for 60 minutes, followed by a time trial, when they got bupropion. Bupropion is a drug that affects on dopamine. It was used at one stage for the treatment of depression. It was used as an appetite suppressant. Its current clinical use is in helping smoking cessation. It acts on dopamine receptors. When the ambient temperature was 18 degrees, Dop uh, bupropion had no effect on exercise performance, placebo or treatment. When the ambient temperature was 30 degrees, the time trial was slower, so a slower time was a worse performance, but bupropion improved exercise performance. So it seems to interact with something that's impairing performance in the heat. Looking at the results in core temperature, and this is not brain temperature, this is rectal temperature, the first hour of steady state exercise, there's no difference between the treatment and the placebo because the exercise intensity is the same. During the time trial, when they worked harder, the temperature becomes higher. So these individuals have been able to work harder and drive their core temperature higher. On the placebo treatment, two of the nine subjects had a core temperature in excess of 40 degrees. On the bupropion treatment, seven of the nine subjects had a core temperature in excess of 40 degrees at fatigue. And this is potentially important because something else that affects dopamine in the brain are the amphetamines. And we know that amphetamines can improve exercise performance by acting on dopamine. We don't have many controlled studies. We do have some observations from the field. This, for anyone who's a cyclist, is Tommy Simpson, one of the early British cyclist who was extremely good in the 1960s. Unfortunately, in the 1967 Tour de France, he collapsed on Mont Ventoux and died. It was an exceptionally hot day. He'd been taking amphetamines. So there's a danger here that taking substances that interfere with dopamine may override the signals that tell us we're tired and tell us it's time to stop. Part of what's going on, and this is the last part of my talk, may involve changes to the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is what keeps in the brain things we want in the brain and keeps out things we don't want. It essentially stops the free exchange of, of substances between the circulation and the brain. And we know it may be compromised in a number of situations. Infections like meningitis, brain tumors, clearly brain damage. It may be compromised in acute heat exposure. It may be influenced by osmotic stress and it may be influenced by exercise, and we've become interested in some of these areas. So normally, this is a capillary with the cells surrounding the capillary. These junctions prevent the entry and exit of things we want to keep separate from the brain. But in some situations, these junctions open, and we get a loss from the brain of substances which we wouldn't normally find in the circulation. One of those substances is a small protein, S100 beta. So we can use the concentration in the, in the blood as a marker of the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. Now, if we do this with exercise, these were subjects exercising, moderate exercise for a fixed period of 60 minutes, once in temperate environmental conditions, and once in the heat. This is the situation at rest. This is the temperate situation. The heat, no difference at rest. It goes up in both situations, but the increase is significant only in the heat. There's some increase in the temperate conditions, but it's not statistically significant. So it does seem that exercising in the heat increases blood-brain barrier permeability. Now, a whole range of things change or potentially change the blood-brain barrier permeability. And one of the things, since we're interested in hydration, is hyperosmolality. If we change the osmolality of the plasma, we potentially change the integrity of that blood-brain barrier. And what this shows is a study where we had subjects exercising for 90 minutes. They got fluids to drink or no fluids to drink. This shows the osmolality of the plasma. It begins much the same 
continues to rise when no fluid is taken, and it falls when drinks are given. So we prevent that large rise in serum osmolality. This is the S100 beta concentration, when people stay well hydrated, and when people become dehydrated, there's a substantial rise in the S100 beta concentration. So the suggestion is that there's possibly an interaction between exercise, heat, hydration, and the integrity of that blood-brain barrier, and we're pursuing that further just now. A whole range of mechanisms may be involved, but this is one that may be important. So in conclusion, we know that hyperthermia and hypohydration can impair exercise performance and can increase the subjective sensation of fatigue. We know that fatigue is a major disincentive to exercise participation, so some clear implications there. At present, we don't understand the mechanisms, but I do hope we will at some time in the not too distant future. Thank you very much for your attention. Clearly, that mechanism can operate in animals. I think the evidence that it can operate in humans is not very good at all. Um, we're not very good at hyperventilating, unlike many animals. Uh, if we begin to hyperventilate, we clearly change acid-base status and a number of other parameters. So increasing our ventilation or changing our ventilation is not really an option. The only data I know that really relate to this is, is studies from the Copenhagen group. As I mentioned before, they've looked at AV differences across the brain. And the striking thing there is that the, the venous blood is hotter than the arterial blood. So the brain is contributing heat even during exercise. We usually think that the increase in body temperature is coming from the muscular activity, which generates a lot of heat but the brain is also contributing to the rise in body temperature during exercise. People have tried to look at ways of selectively cooling the brain by, by wearing caps with ice in them and other things, but it really doesn't happen to any great extent. The trouble is we have a very good um, mechanism for vasoconstriction when we cool the skin. Cooling from the outside isn't effective. There are some studies within the last two years that uh, it's not just hydration that's important, because if you take a drink, you can manipulate the temperature of that drink. If, you drink, uh, if your drink is at a low temperature, you can reduce the sensation of effort and increase exercise time compared to the same volume of drink at a higher temperature. So taking cold drinks during exercise can help to lower body temperature and extend exercise performance. But I'm not sure we have much scope for local manipulation. Other question, please? That, that's an interesting point. For those of you who don't know, we've, we've thought for many years, we've known for many years that taking drinks that contain glucose will enhance exercise performance to a greater extent than taking plain water, and that's part of the basis of sports drinks. Within the last five or six years, there have been several publications showing that if you take a glucose drink, swill it around your mouth and spit it out so that none is swallowed, that too can improve exercise performance, which seems quite remarkable. And it suggests there are some glucose receptors in the brain that respond to the presence of glucose in the mouth. That says to the brain, there's some, there's some energy coming in your direction that's about to be swallowed. It'll soon be available, so you can carry on exercising. Don't worry. Um, the fact it's, it's then not swallowed comes as a bit of a surprise, but the exercise performance is improved. I think you're probably right that we could get a similar effect with swilling the mouse with a cold drink because, of course, that gives a pleasant sensation. And that pleasant sensation in itself may be enough to improve performance. But as far as I'm aware, the study hasn't been done. At present, I'd have to say we have no idea whether there's any vehicle here for improving performance. Uh, we do know, however, that if you're doing prolonged exercise in the heat, bupropion can help 
improve your performance. And it's very interesting that in 2004, the World Anti-Doping Agency removed bupropion from the list of prohibited substances. So there's now nothing to prevent our athletes from using bupropion. And the evidence is, in fact, that the, the, the rate of use has gone up quite dramatically. How we, can, how we can manipulate this to change performance, I don't think we can look directly at what we might do to alter the blood-brain barrier permeability, but we can certainly do things to alter body temperature and to alter body hydration status. I think if there's something that does come out, we can perhaps consider some of the implications of dramatically changing the osmolality of the plasma for drug delivery, for example. If we want to get a drug into the brain that doesn't easily get there, we can perhaps facilitate its access to the brain by, we don't probably in most situations want to exercise people, we can certainly infuse something like glycerol to dramatically elevate the serum osmolality and possibly facilitate opening of the blood-brain barrier. So I think there may be some other directions. Whether there's direct implications for exercise performance at this stage, I don't think so. I think we must uh, stop now. Um, to respect the time uh, for the next sessions. I will ask uh, Professor Luis Seramazem to give uh, the closing remarks. I know that there are other questions. As I said, there will be a coffee break uh, sponsored by the sponsors of the symposium. We can continue our discussion there. Well, thank you, Maria. I more than conclude, I would like to thank the, the organizers and the sponsors to, to let us the opportunity to, to include the hydration topic in this uh, Public Health Nutrition Agenda Conference. I would like to thank you, the speakers, for the excellent presentations. Thank you very much for joining, and thank you, uh, th thank you to all of you to attend. I hope that in next, uh, in next uh, editions of this conference, we will, we will have the results of the research that the different institutions are undertaking to improve their knowledge uh, on the hydration issue. Thank you very much. <laughs>